heard and how that impacts their lives. I'm Ryan E. Wright. I'm a current fellow. Uh, I'm in the College of Musical Arts. I'm a musicologist there. And um, I'm spending my time as a fellow working on a long standing project. I'm writing a history of American opera in, uh, 19, um, from the mid 1970s to about the mid 2000s. Um, and so I gave uh, a talk related to that at the Wave Public Library, um, which is an organization I've worked with before. Um, and then uh, my other sort of community engagement. Um, Fortune didn't end up the way I thought, so I pivoted towards doing some public writing that um, connected with, with my research. All right, so just these are here for all of you. In part, even though the room there isn't that big, I want to make sure folks can hear virtually. So let's kind of at least lean towards the mic as much as possible. So I'll take a few minutes just to go over some of the major um, details of the program. All of this is available on the flyers for the folks in the room and on our website. Um, so there's nothing here that you couldn't return to um, on your own. But basically the program, um, we are currently under the aegis of the College of Arts and Sciences. And so, but faculty from any college across the university are eligible. And as you see here, right, we've got folks from um, other colleges, Ryan from the College of Musical Arts, we've had folks from the College of Education, um, so that's not a barrier. Um, and typically it's two each semester um, that we uh, fund. And we are really encouraging folks um, who are qualified red faculty, um, pre-tenure faculty to really consider applying as well. The only qualification for any application is you have to have gone through um, one enhanced performance review, which basically means you have to have been here three years, sort of gotten the A-OK -okay that you're on track with, you know, um, your particular line, but other than that, open to fields, open to colleges, um, and open to folks of all ranks. So, yeah, so I've sort of um, alluded to some of this. We really, people can reapply, or if they received one before, they can apply again, but we want at least five years between. Um, and we're particularly interested in encouraging folks who haven't had a fellowship before. Um, to really apply for one. And you can hear from some of these folks about why that's a valuable experience. Um, okay, long. This is one of the key um, features of the ICS fellowship in its current form. The program has been around for since the late 90s. Um, and so some of the priorities have shifted, but we really are focused on community engagement and public scholarship. Um, and so that can take a lot of different forms, as you'll hear from our fellows. Um, but we do want, as part of the application, for you to be thinking and talking very clearly about your ideas for what that might look like. And it should be something that really matches with the project you're discussing, right? It shouldn't feel like an add-on. It should feel like a natural extension um, or an enhancement of the priorities of your own research project. And so um, everyone gives at least one kind of public talk, but the format can be quite variable. It does not need to be a typical lecture. It can be something different. Um, and then we can talk more about what that community engagement piece can look like. Some of those are sort of public community engagement, and some are more behind the scenes. Um, and basically, if you're awarded one of these fellowships, you are released from teaching and service during that semester. And this becomes your uh, priority focus. So like a sabbatical, like a faculty improvement leave in that respect. So um, this is new. So for folks who may have uh, looked at our program before, we just completed a revision to our application criteria. So there have been you know, modifications along the way. But this year in particular, um, we've sort of simplified for the next cycle what must be in those applications. And we sort of leave it to you to address these things in ways that make sense for your project. So what we really want you to do is articulate how your project fits within the mission, vision, and principles of ICS. And you get to talk about that in the ways that make sense. And you get to talk about why you're the right person for the project you've imagined. Um, and so our website has our complete mission and vision statement. 
um, and more about those principles. But I want to underscore what they are here a little bit. And these bullet points are those principles. And so these are the things we want you to really be threading through that project. You know, this isn't one of those things where like you have your pro forma fellowship application and then you just like direct it to the new agency. We really want you to address these things. So we care about modeling inclusion. We care about collaborating intentionally. And I can say more about that. Our fellows will have a lot to say about that. We want to empower others, right? This isn't just a, I will bring my knowledge to the benighted corners of fill in the blank. That's not what we're talking about here. We really are talking about um, a more uh, egalitarian relationship and mutually beneficial one. We want folks to come with an open mind, to ask questions, to be curious, um, and to try to you know, questioning the status quo, imagining new ways to do things, new approaches to problems, right? Those sorts of things. And so as part of that, your project should address, it doesn't need to hit all of these, but you need to address how it's in line with these values, as well as what your version uh, and vision for community engagement is for your particular project. And I won't belabor this here. This too is on our website. We are really following the Carnegie Foundation definition of community engagement. And the idea here is that it should be mutually beneficial, right? And it should be an exchange of knowledge and resources in a context of partnership and reciprocity. So again, not this sort of I'm going to come in and, and give them something, but really developing a program in collaboration so that both parties really feel um, they learned something from the process and are benefiting from that arrangement. Just details for the coming cycle. So um, in applications will be due October 13th, 2023. So if you've checked this before, it's slightly earlier than in previous years. Um, but this will help the committee deliberate um, and make sure that we can get all the necessary approvals from the college and the provost level in time. Um, we will, we, it is an online portal for the application. So that will be open um, by mid August. So you encourage folks to apply early rather than wait until that last minute. Um, and you can access that through our website, which is bgsu.edu forward slash ICS. And on the left navigation, there is a, one of the buttons is for faculty fellowship program. And there is a sub button there um, that says apply. And you, if you scroll down, it will remind you of the things I've just said. And then you can begin an application. So um, that's kind of my bit. Um, I guess I want to make sure some of our fellows have to, who are not on fellowship right now have to go teach, but I want to make sure we can hear from them. Um, so we have Angela Algren from Theater and Film, John Dow from Media and Communication, Brian Ebright from Musicology, um, Ali Hogue in the School of Art. Um, Nikki Caleb Hughes isn't here today, but she said she's happy to talk to folks about her own project. Um, her, she's in political science, so folks who are maybe more social science-y, she would be a great person um, to talk to, um, and Mikhaila Walsh. Uh, so our, those are the fellows who are here. I'll kick it off with a question. Um, so for each of you, um, what was one of the best you know, best parts of the experience of being a fellow. Could be a surprising one or exactly what you expected, but one of the best experiences. What's So for me, the community engagement uh, portion was definitely a highlight. In order to get to my project, I asked uh, different colleagues and people in the BG uh, community for ideas, um, sort of loosely based around my project, uh, which was about how uh, an indigenous community in central Mexico navigated a uh, crisis during the pandemic transnationally. And one thing that I found during the course of my research uh, was the issue of translation being 
uh, a challenge. Uh, the Latinx community was disproportionately affected by COVID in part because of a lack of access to accessible information and because of language barriers. And so I came to partner with upper level Spanish classes at BG High. And my project entailed uh, collaborating with students to talk about uh, the importance of translation. And what we ended up doing uh, was creating bilingual pop art posters um, in Spanish, well, Spanish and English uh, that debunked myths around the coronavirus as well as uh, provided information about where uh, people could access uh, vaccines, et cetera, here in the PG community. And in addition to that, I uh, spoke to the Wood County Public Library who allowed me to showcase this art in, um, in their foyer, which was wonderful because it encouraged uh, high school students to go to the library and it also allowed the community to, to receive information, both in Spanish and English. And then in addition to that, students uh, showcased their work at ArtsX here at BGSU, which is a real effort to bridge the university with the broader community. And I think one of the wonderful outcomes of that was that students, high school students came to BG to see their work and felt a sense of, of pride and accomplishment. In addition, they were able to see other wonderful uh, arts that are, are taking place here. Just to close, this collaboration has opened up future collaborations with uh, the Spanish teacher um, at BG, um, who I'll be working with in the fall to create um, altar installations for Dia de Muertos. So again, working to bridge the BG community and bring high school students to the to the university with the hope that maybe they'll think about attending uh, this school. Yeah, um, that's really exciting, like community engagement. Um, I think like for myself, I think the community engagement part was like really surprisingly, like it was, it pushed me in a way, um, like when you're working with like design and like development of, uh, we were in like early research phase. Um, I always am kind of hesitant to kind of like disseminate my knowledge while it's all in progress, but it, it uh, pushed me to um, to really like talk about our research where it was and, and enter into a conversation. Um, so I, I had a, a public lecture here at BG, but um, I also it also pushed me to um, be part of a lecture in Toledo during the International Year in Glass about um, the history of glass in Toledo and it uh, allowed me to kind of like envision and like think about the narrative of what we were doing um, with, with our glass project and how it fit in with the narrative of uh, in innovation in Toledo um, with in its history in glass. So it was a really wonderful um, other presentation that we did a couple months after my um, uh, my ICS fellowship, which was really helpful and connected me with a lot of folks and we engaged in a really great conversation because there was a lot of folks within the glass community in Toledo that was in that presentation that, that offered a lot to a conversation where we had a great exchange. So that was a surprising, like wonderful benefit that that brought me brought me out of my comfort zone in a good way. Yeah, I'm gonna pick, piggyback on a lot of that. I think for me, um, it was both a challenge, but a pleasant surprise. It was a good challenge uh, stepping out of my comfort zone. I typically don't do a lot of collaborative work uh, in, the, in the area that I'm in for a variety of reasons. Um, so I was a little nervous on that aspect and the need to relinquish that control uh, let the students who I was working with at BGSU, uh, BGSU um, at BG High School kind of dictate uh, the, the topic related to AI and social media that they were interested in, I think uh, was, was beneficial for me, uh, I know, and I actually, you know, learned a lot from kind of stepping back and watching the process as more of an observer early on. Uh, rather than having to have control of the whole process from start to finish. So that was a good, a good surprise and a good challenge for me. Oh, sorry. 
So um, I, for me so far, the, the most, I don't know if it's surprising, but I uh, gave my talk at a local theater at the Black Swamp Players. And I, one of the things that was the most meaningful, I, my, my project is interview based so far. Um, and in the fall, I had a faculty improvement leave. So I was able to conduct a number of interviews then and be able to share some of the um, insights of those participants in my talk. And I think one of the most meaningful pieces of feedback I got was from a colleague who teaches our stage management class, um, who said, you know, I really think there's some folks who we, you know, graduates that we have and people she knows who are out there working as stage managers who will feel seen and heard by some of that research by hearing from other stage managers. And um, I think that for me, that thought is going to continue to shape the next steps of my project because it actually encourages me to be much more reciprocal in terms of how I engage with people who are working as stage managers and, and maybe thinking about how they how and where they want to see themselves reflected. So of course, you know, we, we, we publish articles and, and write books, but you know, it has me thinking about other ways to continue engaging with people throughout the research process. So the question was kind of about surprises, right? Yeah. What was the biggest surprise? Um, so uh, a few surprises, one one negative, one positive. The negative one was that I had envisioned uh, forming some sort of collaboration, collaborative relationship with Toledo Opera, which is our local opera company. Um, but despite um, numerous uh, emails, from, not numerous, I didn't them, but um, just I got absolutely zero response from them, which was somewhat surprising. Um, so, so that did turn out the way um, I had envisioned. Um, I had hoped to sort of develop something collaboratively with them. Um, but the sort of good surprise was that um, uh, I was asked by um, by a magazine, Alfred News Magazine, to write a um, uh, a short piece about the founding of Minnesota Opera, which is an opera company that was started in the early 1960s, um, and. And, and so I said, yes, um, I thought that would actually tie in quite nicely with the sort of um, the early stages of the history that I'm working on. And so I went to uh, to Minnesota to dig into some archives there um, and actually found quite a bit of material that tied in really directly with the sort of opening chapter of my book. Um, so that was a quite a lovely surprise. You've alluded to uh, your own challenge, um, Ryan, but um, Makala, any particular challenges you experienced um, and you know, want to share that in, in so far as it's useful and instructive for folks who might um, be applying or get one of these uh, next year? I think uh, you, know, you have a, a lot of time on your hands uh, during this during this fellowship, so as different from having to be on campus and be engaged with students and your own research, you really have this 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 focus. Um, so, disciplining yourself, uh, finding a, a schedule, um, setting out goals, what you'd like to read, the literature you'd like to engage. Um, these were were some of my my challenges because I haven't had that kind of freedom to to really pursue something that I, I care about without other responsibilities and, and constraints. Yeah, mine, uh, it's like the constraints of like, actually within like a semester, I had like the difference <laughs> of like having to make sure like the, I really wanted to have like a finished project, like something in class by the end of the semester. And all of the lead times that it takes to like, work with other um, like subcontractors to like help make this mold and then like refine like our digital models and like go through all of our prototyping. Um, you know, it was, I we got the mold and it like wasn't perfect and we had to send it back by our like, by the day that we actually um, presented. So we had like a rush on that mold. <laughs> so I had like, like a time crunch at the end, like wanting, you know, having a like, what I, like imagination of like what I want to get done by the end and then kind of like having the reality of, of the time it takes um, 
working with like physical manufacturer of things to like get it all done. But it, it helped. I'm always really good with a deadline. So it was helpful in that way to like push things along and make decisions. Yeah, I think for me early on, I think one of the major challenges was trying to understand uh, the relationship between the formal academic part and the community engagement part. And Julie will probably attest to this. I was like, no, what, what's the difference between these two or something? She was very kind and, and helped me kind of parse out the, the, the difference between those two. So understanding how they were distinct yet interrelated, for me, that was kind of the challenge. And then related to that kind, uh, that, that element was uh, the, the, uh, the challenge of not having control over <laughs> the work that was being done by other people was a little bit um, nerve wracking for me. Um, it, 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 they were amazing. Uh, but I kind of didn't know what was happening on their end. So I was kind of like, hey, how's it going over there with that? Do you want me to come over and oversee what you're doing or whatever? And they're like, no, I'll leave us alone. We're doing fine. Um, so <laughs> so whenever you know they had a question about uh, the material or the research or they had kind of some sort of conceptual or theoretical question, um, you know, I would kind of come in. But other than that, you know, it was them kind of going through the process, thinking about what they wanted to say and how they wanted to communicate about the issue that we we're dealing with. So uh, those were kind of the two main challenges for me. Um, yeah, I think I think for me the probably also the community engagement part because I had applied um, for this fellowship before and, and not gotten it and gotten good feedback. Um, but I think because the work and it wasn't for this project, but I think for this project because the the focus is on stage managers who are dispersed throughout the country and there's not like a big you know there's not like a sort of like stage manager community that's local so to speak i think it took some time it and is i'm still like really thinking about how do i engage that community um and i think for myself i don't often think of myself as a quote unquote community engaged scholar and i think that that this has this challenge has really helped make me feel more comfortable and excited about that because I found that it's like, well, people are interested in what I'm thinking about, and so we're interested in being con in conversation together. And and for me, I you know I'm thinking about the community engagement as being more like I just need to listen, and that's very similar to the kind of research I'm doing. So it's actually feels much more natural of a fit than I would have assumed. So I, mean, I already alluded a bit to some of the challenges that I had. Um, and I guess if I could sort of, I guess the, the biggest challenge, is, challenge for me that ultimately I would say was unsuccessful is sort of forging a new relationship. Um, ultimately for the engagement portion of what I did, I sort of relied on existing relationships that I had already built. So with uh, Wayne Public Library, um, back in 2019, I had served as their first um, expert in residence, I think that's what they're calling it. Um, I was a musicologist in residence, and they've since had an artist and uh, 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 other experts. Um, I can't remember them all. I think there was a mindfulness expert. Um, uh, and then also I've done some writing for, um, for sort of general readership uh, publications, and so uh, I was able to sort of rely on those pre-existing connections to engage, um, I guess, in some sense at the sort of like hyper-local level with the way library, but then I would say on a sort of national level for these um, publications. Yeah, and I think you can hear from the project, right, that it's not a one-size-fits-all approach to what community engagement needs to look like, what those projects need to look like, or that it has to be local in the sense of you know, a, an X radius of the GSU, right? Um, and that's why I say we want these things to sort of make sense for your distinct um, project. And some folks come in with existing relationships. It's like, great, I want to use this. And some folks, you know, meet with me, you know, or get feedback on kind of ideas for the ways that their projects could engage with the community. Um, and yeah, and, and that notion of community, sometimes it is, we've had a, a previous fellow was in education and he was working on sanctuary cities and um, sanctuary schools. 
And so he, that research with a research collaborator was happening in California and in Chicago and in, on the East Coast. And so there were very distinct communities that were a part of that research. But part of, and so that research was going out and having these conversations and part of talking with him was about convening those folks in a kind of private meeting to sort of get them to hear from each other about some of the different strategies. Because some of the research subjects already had sanctuary policies and had experienced kind of community pushback, community support. Others wanted to develop those things. So there was an opportunity there. You know, sometimes that community engagement should be public. A different example would be um, Melissa Miller in political science. Hers was on women running for political office. And in the 2018 midterm elections, it was like a historic number of women running and winning, right? Both Democratic and Republican women. And so her partnership, she already had relationships with the League of Women Voters. She put on a workshop that they co-sponsored that was how to run for office, like what is actually involved, whether it's school board or city council or other things to sort of demystify what is that process? What do you need in terms of fundraising and other things? So again, lots of different ways this can go. Um, some of our folks will have to leave, so I want to make sure we answer any questions. Cindy or Lynn, do you have any questions that you have for our fellows? I mean, I just came with an open mind to hear what you all have to say, and all of your research sounds really interesting. One question that just comes to mind, which wouldn't have anything to do with me applying for the fellowship or not, but just I'm curious, have you published the community engagement aspect of your work? Have any of you published like that? I, mean, I understand we all have to publish in our little prestigious research journals, but it seems to me the goal of this is to get beyond that. So I'm just curious if you publish. I mean, Michaela, your, your work sort of was published right in the library, in a sense, people could go in and see that and benefit from it. But have you written up like anything about that part of your work? That's a, a great idea. Uh, no, I haven't. I've been more focused on writing up my yeah. findings from my, my research, but I, I love that idea and I can see it being very productive. I would just say the, the publication um, was sort of the community, community engagement for me for the, um, the profile that I wrote about the founding of Minnesota Opera. Um, so that, that will be, I'll use material for that in my book, but then it's also being published in the, I think the July issue of Operatives Magazine, which is not a scholarly um, publication, it's for opera people. Some other examples I can give though, um, Chris Wotolsky, another College of Musical Arts faculty, um, was a, a fellow a couple of years back, and his community engagement involved, um, his project was on Arab American music um, across the US. And what are the kind of communities and networks and how do they define that term in various ways? And part of his project was actually doing interviews and sort of like oral histories with folks who are writing, performing, conducting, participating in these communities around Arab American music. Um, and those are going to be kind of made publicly available through the university libraries. So that's another model for how this can work. And I think, you know, We've selected folks who have had their fellowships very recently. So some of this may continue to gestate for a while, but I think one of the things that I've heard from folks, maybe who a little further out um, for the fellowship, is that being pushed out of their comfort zone, thinking about different ways of doing research, different ways of communicating and collaborating about that, um, did end up leading to unexpected things down the road, sometimes um, through things in like Ohio humanities and sort of becoming a kind of expert on um, Ohio Chautauqua kinds of events, right? That sometimes it it follows later on and, and unexpected developments can occur. So I, I hope that for all of you, right, that maybe some of these things will show up in altered form um, to reflect on that community engagement piece in the future. Do you have any questions? Uh, yeah. yeah. So uh, so as for the community engagement component, uh, so do I need to get in touch with the community partner in advance to get their approval or things like that? 
So this is something that we don't require, but we really do encourage. So if you have a really good idea for what that partner might be that makes sense, we do encourage you to reach out, start a conversation, because part of what that gets into with the kind of Carnegie definition of community engagement is once you start those conversations, what you end up doing will look different than what you went in thinking community engagement would look like. So John, right, that was very much your experience. Um, and so the earlier you can begin that process, the more you can be prepared to truly figure out what do they need and want and how can you partner with them so that you benefit, but you're also giving them what they want, as opposed to sort of saying, I want to give you this thing. Do you want my gift? <laughs> you know? So if you have those ideas, please begin those conversations. Um, and if folks don't have ideas, one thing I, you know, some of you, not all of you, but a couple of you um, did meet with me in advance of the application to say, here's what I'm thinking about. Can you give me, you know, am I on the right track? Do you have any suggestions? And that is also always available. That, that is sort of the director's role is to help, you know, brainstorm, guide folks, make connections if there aren't those pre-existing ones, um, so that you can sort of know some next steps to take or have some different ideas maybe that you came in with. Thank you. Okay, so this is a more practical thing, and I know that the application process, you know, has evolved over time, but even still, any advice for the application process, for like crafting your narrative, for thinking about talking about community engagement in relationship to your project, anything that you would suggest? Start on this end, this time, as you take a bite of cookie. <laughs> um, I mean, I always think just being able to um, talk about why it matters or think about why it matters is sort of fundamental sort of question of like, so what, why does it matter? Um, and then being able to communicate about your project in, in non-technical language, I think that's one of the challenges for all scholars in academia is, is that aspect of communi communicating with um, with audiences or with readers who don't necessarily share, share the same vocabulary and context that you do. Um, so really sort of reading it with, um, uh, without the sort of uh, filter of, of all your past experiences, reading it as if you know nothing about what you're talking about and posing. Yeah, I, I would echo that. I think um, I, I started to think about that I would need to just I think I almost thought about it as like I might be spending a paragraph teaching readers what a stage manager is and why they're so important to theater because they part of the project is that they're invisible so I don't expect that people know who they are or what they do um, but also I think for myself I I tried to frame this project both for this and for the um, faculty improvement leave in kind of simplified theoretical terms because I think we can get so deep into our complicated theories that I just really tried to think about this as a project that was going to bring together theater studies and labor studies and labor studies is new to me right so just and there's a lot more that will go into it of course but really trying to frame it in the largest possible like kind of like the large know, the smallest common denominator whatever the term is is um, Really, and it also helped me think about what this project was supposed to be doing. Yeah, I think I think that's one thing that I would echo as well. Um, you know, clarity of language, uh, but also, so I had many years ago also, and I received one. And I think the main difference between that application and the successful one was uh, a clear vision, uh, whereas my my unsuccessful one kind of. I wasn't entirely clear myself, and so that very much came through in the application. And so, think really thinking through what is my vision for this for this project, uh, and then just try to articulate it in as clear and grounded a way as possible. Yeah, um, for me, I feel like yeah, I I I saw that I didn't I saw this uh, opportunity like pretty close to the deadline and I like discovered it, but I was like, it felt like a good fit. 
So it was um, one of those things where there was clarity. It was like, oh, this is an opportunity and I could see how this could like both help me and also fit within the vision of the ICS fellowship. So I think that, you know, like making sure that it is a good fit and then also like thinking about, you know, um, like this aspect of collaboration and community and, you know, thinking at it from a design aspect is like, you know, it's like, like what, you know, I think that it was like asking some questions of like, how is this design of a benefit to others? And like, kind of like it's a different lens than like maybe some other projects because it is like this like kind of like physical design output. And, uh, and I think that kind of just like thinking through this application with that lens and making sure that it was like coming from the authentic place was really helpful. Yeah. I think for me, um, I think Kind of distilling my my topic, it felt so overwhelming. Uh, like it could be a, a book or something. And so, how do I um, refine my language and my concept into something, you know, manageable, digestible, and in, in a short, you know, a short space? And then thinking collaboratively, reaching out to to colleagues and and friends and asking them to read my application to highlight. You know, maybe places where I wasn't being clear, or um, you know, where I was rambling, etc. So that was really, uh, I think, helpful to me, as well as identifying what's at stake uh, in this this project. Why it, why is it important, um, and really highlighting that as well. I think one of the evolutions of the uh, fellowship program and of ICS itself is. You know, I, we used to sort of frame this in terms of discuss the interdisciplinary nature of the project. And I hope you can hear in all of the examples, all of them are fundamentally interdisciplinary in some way, but it's less important now to sort of frame it in those terms than in those stakes terms. Like, why does this matter? How is this important for kind of the public good, right? Um, and so, you know, that may, for some folks, that may feel more awkward. For some folks, that may feel more comfortable. Um, but our goal here is to sort of push people towards thinking of the research and creative work that you're doing does have benefits outside of the university. But we have to think through those and maybe communicate and engage differently than we do when we are writing for an academic journal or presenting at an annual meeting. And for many of us, that is not part of kind of the routine workings of graduate school, tenure track, QRF, um, you know, life. And so this is an opportunity to kind of, you know, test out, you know, dip your toes into the water uh, of different kinds of uh, of scholarship and creative work in different forms of, um, you know, engagement. Any other questions? Thank you. All right, I know John and Mikhaila, you have to go teach, so we will let you go, but I do have some other questions for the rest of you, if that's okay. Sure. Okay. Um, so, this is about the community engagement, right? Um, again, and so, you know, we touched on this, but maybe kind of a, for you to do a little nitty, a little, you know, grittier about this. What advice do you have for folks, maybe who don't have um, community engagement partners in mind, um, or um, for, you know, thinking differently about this? What advice for folks who this is a new area for them? How can they approach thinking about who a good partner is and how to engage in a relationship that really is reciprocal? Ooh, gosh, um, I mean, one possibility is, is just thinking about who are you writing about, um, who are you studying. Um, I guess I don't think. I mean, something that I that I do in my in my as a historian who works on the recent past is, is I do have the um, the opportunity to to talk to and interview people, um, and so there is already a sort of collaborative relationship there in terms of um, constructing this history. Um, but then, um, you know, thinking about how that might play out in a sort of, um, where are we going with this? 
in a, in a, in a different way. Um, so something that I'm still sort of toying with is um, a lot of what I'm thinking about in this history of opera that I'm writing is, is sort of transformations of opera at a, at a sort of national level. Um, and so thinking then if that's what I'm writing about, thinking about the types of organizations and institutions that I'm writing about, like for instance, um, the National Opera Service Organization, Opera America, is, is something that I'm still um, thinking about um, forming some sort of relationship with them uh, because I am writing about that organization and what effect it's had um, in the sort of art world of, of American opera. So, um, yeah, I guess the, the short answer is um, to think about who you are writing about and look in that direction. That sort of speaks to you, Angie, right? Yeah, yeah, I could echo that. And I also, you know, I think there's also a way that in some ways because of the pandemic and our use of Zoom and virtual events, that that has also opened up, you know, opened things up significantly that people actually attend virtual events. And um, so, so yeah, I think like organizations that, you know, kind of depends if you're studying people or if you're just, you know, studying phenomena, but also thinking about like, related communities or related themes um, that might be reflected on a more local level that you know maybe not are, are not exactly directly part of your research project but might be um, you know thematically tied or politically tied or something like that yeah and Ali you know could you talk a little bit about you know you have sort of several different communities right because you've got artists you've got the manufacturing realm can you talk a bit about your case? Yeah, um, like I said, we, we did a, like within the, the timeline of the uh, ICS fellowship, uh, it was really close but didn't quite align with, uh, so I, I did a BGSU based uh, lecture that was public, and uh, but I was also uh, enrolled in a later uh, lecture. Um, and I think that uh, like in Toledo at the Libby House, um, and uh, for those of you who don't know, um, like the history of glass in Toledo, it's like uh, a ton of glass industry uh, started in Toledo. Uh, Libby Owens Ford, um, and that like started like bottle manufacture, like pressed glass and float glass. And float glass in its uh, uh, like current contemporary process, um, which is an amazing process where like molten glass is on a bed of zinc. It all started in Toledo. So. Um, for me, it's like, you know, like, like who can I have a conversation with that is like not an echo chamber? So it's um, like being able to be part of that lecture series. Um, it really was thinking about the history, talking about the history of, of glass in Toledo during the International Year of Glass. So I had, but it was a totally different community than I, I normally talk to. And I met a ton of people. I met um, this uh, one woman who was, uh, she just retired from Libby and she was like the mold cutter for all of like the and like she was like one of the first mold cutters that was a woman you know she told me about her whole life story from like going to a factory when she was like somehow 16 and it's like I'm gonna be that person that designs the molds and like, you know and like we got into like a wonderful conversation so and these are just the community members that are tied to glass and Toledo that I, I just never had an opportunity to have a conversation with so that was something that was like really exciting to me. So I was like, I have like this community right here in Toledo that that is in connection and that could like offer a wonderful conversation about like the direction of where I'm going and like also to contextualize the past. So um, that was really exciting for me and like getting the out of my comfort zone of like presenting in progress work like publicly <laughs> like from like the ICS <laughs> fellowship was like a really great way to push me on my comfort zone and have this conversation. So it was great. It was like wonderful to be able to do that. And that is the thing I hear a lot. Folks are like, well, mm, can I present next semester? Because I'm not going to finish and the answer is no, you can't. Like, you know, it's like exciting about like nerve wracking out of our comfort zone, but there is yeah. something exciting for audiences and yeah. I think for the presenter right, to sort of be a little bit more exploratory, maybe tentative um, about that. But then to sort of, you're, it's still early enough that that particular question prompts you know a kind of new direction or things like that so encourage folks to like not shy away 
from that, that to lean into that, that, you know, there are folks who apply at different stages of the project, but no one ever feels like totally ready to present. It always feels like, mm, you know, it's not yet in like page proofs, therefore it's not ready. Um, and I think to, to a person, when that, once you do it, like, it's fun, mm -hmm. right? Like, and you get great response from folks. What else? Other questions or other things we haven't touched on, um, fellows, that you would want to share? It was like precious time to like, like just have, I don't know, just have time to think about your research in an unabbreviated way with that kind of like deadline. It's just like so helpful to like act as like a pressure pot to like really move forward with like these ideas that mean a lot to you. Yeah. Yeah. It's just, you know, precious time. <laughs> yeah, I think it was helpful for me too to know that this is a semester, so I need to do, I need to, you know, frame the goals in what you can accomplish in a semester. So that's going to be just a small part of a, of a larger project. And so, but also I think what it's allowed me is, is the freedom to think, okay, I'm going to, I do want to get out this like article, you know, to start becoming part of this conversation in a scholarly way too. But I also love that it's giving me time to really think about, well, how do I want to shape the larger project that like the next couple of years of my research, I, it, it just, it has, there's, yeah, there's a lot of uh, like freedom in having that time to really think about that. Yeah. <laughs> and the semester comes up like too fast. Yeah, it, yeah, it always comes up. Yeah, and like um, you both are the fellows this year, right? Yeah. It's like one thing just having like a little bit of like I've like a year out now, so it's like I'm still working on this project. You know, it's like it gives you it's like a pressure pot where you could actually get some headway. You could get a like a significant chunk of that research done. That gives you momentum to get to the next next step and like keep going. Or, um, you know, it's uh, it, it's really great to like kind of like think back to like that first semester and everything that we got done and like, you know, it's like I'm still working with my collaborator. We meet every week and, you know, so it's like, and like that really like gave that opportunity and that invitation to like get a lot of the work done. Yeah. So like thank like ICS for that. Did any of you go through IRB approval and did you do that prior to submitting your application? Curiosity What's on that? IRB. Um, it's the Institutional Review Board. So oh, if you work with subjects, subjects, subjects. Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, okay. Thank you. I did <laughs> have to do that, but I because I had I sort of started officially started the project earlier, um, so that was already in place. But I think I would have needed to do that. I would have done it ahead of time. I think. really recommend doing it. Before. Yeah, because it can yeah, take long. Well, yeah. You know, yeah, yeah. It's, right. it's unpredictable. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Yeah, I think that like some of the things, I, I guess one other thing I would just add that we haven't touched on is um, none of the fellows who are able to be here today um, are QRF faculty, right? Um, but we have had um, qualified grant faculty as fellows, and I can I will report on their behalf because they've said to me is especially because research and creative work is not part of their workload, um, the fellowship period was for them, like a real refresh, right? For some of them, it was getting back to research that had sort of been back burner for a long time. For others, it was about like, ooh, connecting things they've been thinking about pedagogically and teaching, but wow, how do you level that up and out in a really big way? Um, and you know, and you know, each one has their own story, but for folks who are interested in applying to a QRF, really want to encourage you, like, you know, we are we do want to support all different kinds of faculty um, across the university in different uh, departments and colleges um, in different ranks. Uh, if you've got a project that you think aligns with that mission, vision, and principles of ICS, we want to hear about it. Um, and, you know, everyone will kind of use that time in their own way. Some folks are traveling to do research. Other folks, you know, um, are staying close to home. But um, in, no matter what, for everyone, it does alter those daily rhythms, right? Um, and gives a chance to sort of go deeper and to be more reflective about those projects. And it's, 
mutually possible in a typical semester. I guess I have maybe one last question, and um, this is sort of about did the fellowship alter in any way your sense of yourself as a publicly engaged scholar or creative um, or change your perceptions about what public engagement, public scholarship could be? And if so, like any advice for others who are uncertain about that, you know, who are used to writing for an academic audience, you know, or for, you know, presenting in those sorts of conference circles, right? I'm mulling this over a little bit. Um, I mean, in a sense, I mean, in a sense, no, in that I had already, I've already done a, sort of, um, a fair amount of writing for yeah. non scholarly audiences. Um, but this isn't really to answer your question. But something that I was thinking about was, was you know, I think um, hearing from Ali and from Angie, it seemed like the projects that they were proposing were sort of um, fairly early in the sort of in the gestation process, whereas what I proposed was sort of like I'd been sort of doing this research for several years and needed the space to sort of sit down and you know um, weave it together and. Um, in some sense, that was a hindrance to me in terms of trying to conceive of how to um, uh, how to find a way to to um, create sort of collaborative community engagement um, project. So I guess maybe it's not surprising then that the, the thing that I ended up doing and writing about was was um, actually the, the sort of newest part of my research. Um, in some sense, I think having that um, that part of the research be more open ended um, did allow for more flexibility in terms of what that might um, what that might look like in terms of uh, public scholarship. Um, yeah, I think that it. I think it sort of. I think it's the right project in some ways for me to think about being a public, more of a community engaged scholar. And I, I think in that sense, um, what I'm finding is that it's, it's like I get nervous about public speaking. And then once I do it, I'm like, oh, this is fun. And like, it's really the, the back and forth that is the fun part. And so I think I am looking forward to, especially with this project, being able to engage with as, at least the public on the level of like talking to other people in related industries, um, but actually maybe also doing, you know, engaging in some projects where you educate audiences about backstage labor and, you know, things like that. So I think it's, it's, it's um, inspiring a lot of ideas for what could be done. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I feel like just as like an artist, it's like, you know, that's also in academia, it's like, Yes, like I, I like present papers to like my academic community within like the art, you know, like the glass community, like field glass. But we also are pretty conditioned to like give like public artist talks, um, and in a way that like speaks about our work, especially to just you know to a to a general audience. But I think working with a, a collaborating with architecture in this way, it's kind of uh, it's really kind of interesting that. We, I, since the ICS, we've done uh, like a regional I Corps program through like the uh, National National Science Foundation, which basically is like trying to see if this, if your if your um, design or what you're producing has commercial viability. And even though that seems like pretty like staunch, it forced you to have like all these interviews with different people to see how they relate to like what you're designing in this in this interesting way it turned it out to be like surprising as well it's like this like conversation and like learning about if uh, what you're making has a use if there is a desire for it if there is a demand um, and then on top of that like uh, like the direction of like our grant writing to build an actual building with these blocks is um, you know it's like right now we're applying for uh, money to build a building um, 
on the, in, a, in a dark sky zone and you know the Percy of Michigan's property, but that's where my collaborator works and it's in Pelston. And it's a and so we're proposing to like build a small structure that's going to be like a like an artist retreat on the property that like other people can then come in and like spend time in and then also do like circadian sleep research with human subjects. So but but like thinking about like how could we make this like make something that's also beneficial to a larger population and it's not just for like research for research sake, right? And then so it's opened up those kind of opportunities which I haven't you know, like which before I haven't really like entered into. Whereas like that kind of like conversation with the community to see who could benefit from what we're making. Yeah. Any other questions? Well, thank you so much for sharing your experiences. <laughs> and if folks do have specific follow-up questions, maybe ones related to the kinds of projects you were doing or your community engagement pieces, is it okay for folks to reach out? It's totally. All right, very good. Thank you all very, very much. Please take some stuff to go. <laughs> I'm going to have one of those screens. Do it. Um, and I hope that we get, I hope you'll consider applying in this next cycle. Yeah.